What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Fight Network Studios. This is Five Rounds. I am John Ramdean alongside Robin Black, and we have a loaded show for you as we take a look at the UFC heavyweights. We hear from one of Canada's top lightweight fighters. Robin breaks down one of the best Asian welterweights in the UFC, and then we will hear from longtime mixed martial arts promoter Mark Pavlich. But we start with the heavyweight division on October 19th. We will get to see the rubber match. The UFC is calling it the absolute best heavyweight trilogy of all time and I can't say I disagree with them. It goes down at the Toyota Center as Cain Velasquez takes on JDS uh, Junior DeSantos and Robin what a sensational matchup. Uh, you like this fight? Yeah man you gotta love this fight. There was a time when the heavyweight boxing championship of the world was such a grand event that everyone on the planet knew it was coming. Everybody knew who the heavyweight champ was. Everyone knew who the number one contender is and you know what this is the sport of fighting freestyle fighting and these are the two best heavyweights on the planet we should get excited and with that said we'll take a look at some of the other big players in the UFC's largest division and we see Cain Velasquez the UFC heavyweight champion on top but really from number one to number 10 littered with extreme talent you have Fabrizio Verdun ADCC champion in there Daniel Cormier who's going to be fighting on the same card as Cain Velasquez and Junior DeSantos Josh Barnett had a successful uh, return to the UFC with his win over Frank Mir. Frank Mir's in there. Travis Brown going to be taking on Josh Barnett. And I have Minotauro Noguera at number 10. A little bit of a debate, Robin, yeah. we had. Should we put Stipe Miocic at number 10? But, you know, that fight with Roy Nelson uh, got the decision victory, the biggest victory of his career. And I think you have to reward Minotauro for the things that he's done thus far uh, in the UFC and mixed martial arts. But uh, I'm really intrigued at the Josh Barnett-Travis Brown fight. Yeah. And I'm also a little nervous about the Frank Mir Alistair Overeem fight because we heard Dana White say that uh, you know with a loss these guys could be could be out and I just don't think it makes sense there's so many storylines that you could use Frank Mir or Alistair Overeem and to have one of these guys lose and get booted it doesn't make sense yeah man and we just saw that with Yushin Okami ranked number six or number seven in the world at middleweight these are two top ten legit guys you're gonna lose some fights when you fight big powerful monsters like this neither one of those guys needs to be cut but one of them's gonna uh, Daniel Cormier I mentioned taking on Roy Nelson on that card as well what a killer lightweight contest as a uh, former strike force champion Gilbert Melendez takes on Diego Sanchez. I absolutely love this card, but there's a fight card that's happening before that, believe it or not. Fight Night 29, the main event, a sensational welterweight tilt between Damian Maya, probably the best submission fighter in the game, taking on the rugged Jake Shields. Uh, I actually think that this fight is going to be closer than a lot of people believe. I think that stylistically, Jake Shields is a perfect matchup for Damian Maya. Yeah, it's a great fight, man. There's a bunch of great fights on two great cards coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to seeing your 170-pound board next week. But yeah, it is a very close fight. Damian Maya looks unbeatable. Man, these are two of the most exciting divisions in sports right now. Uh, also, the co-feature of that matchup in Brazil, Eric Silva, one of the top Brazilian welterweights takes on one of the top Asian welterweights, Dong Young Kim, a guy that we've watched fight for quite a long time. Yeah, Eric Silva is a slick, slick striker, and we think of Dong Young Kim as this judo player with beautiful takedowns and, you know, the ability to really rough you up on the ground. But I think we're missing a little bit when we talk that way because you and I have the good fortune to be in the English broadcast team on deep, and there was a period from October of 2006 till August of 2007, under a year, where Dong Young Kim knocked out five guys. I want to take a look th at that in the breakdown. Like I said, we're thinking of this guy as a high-level judo player with crazy takedowns and a stifling top game. But that is not the whole story. During that one-year period, he knocked out five guys using this laser-like left hand. Johnny Hendricks, we think of him as the big left-hand power puncher in the UFC. But Dong Young Kim puts guys away with this precision left, either the straight left or the uppercut. And if you're too worried about that, you may see the right hook as well. But this guy has a very legitimate striking game that since 2007 he's been keeping in his back pocket and do not be surprised if he pulls this out for Eric Silva you saw the uppercut right there he f just makes you watch the left hand so much feeds you that right hook as well but man does he have power in this left and when he puts it on you and he can switch to the knees here we've seen that in the past puts this one out of reach against Hidenobu Koiki this guy took so much abuse here knees up the middle watch for the left 
And watch the feints there as well. Just feints, fakes the kick, and watch this precision shot. Waits, boom. He's spring-loading himself and using that to feint in and out of distance. There we see it again. This guy ate six or seven enormous lefts throughout this fight. And watch this one. Man, this is beautiful. He sets it up with a head kick, and boom. We have to see that again. Ouch. That is nasty, drops him there as well. But he has taken apart in that run some of the toughest guys in Japan at the time. In deep hitter, Hiko Hasegawa was one of the most rugged guys going. Watch this, just beautiful timing on that and here as well, slow motion. Ka Boom, right on the chin, hurts this man bad. And this looks a little more like the Dong Young Kim we got used to. That man's unconscious right there. Let's mount him and punch him out until the ref stops it. If we see this come back into his game against Eric Silva, this is going to be a spectacular fight. Do not underestimate the striking of Dong Young Kim. I love Dong Young Kim. This guy always brings it, but Eric Silva knows the importance of this victory. Right now, the welterweight division is looking fantastic. And of course, next week, we look at my welterweight weight rankings, but also Hector Lombard making his drop to 170 pounds. Also on this fight night card, Mike Pierce uh, taking on Husam Palharas, who is also dropping down to 170 pounds. Really a good time for the welterweight division. And, you know, Robin, we've kind of heard that George St. Pierre could be nearing the end of his mixed martial arts career. One, two, three, four, five fights away. Who knows? 31, 32? You yeah. believe it's two fights, yeah. you think? Yeah, yeah why? I think why? so. I don't know. The guy's kind of done everything that he needs to do at this point this is not a sport that you do forever when you've been dominant you've written your storybook you know you see all of these guys coming up right now what do you do do you take a deep deep breath and go yeah I'm ready to face six or seven of these guys or do you put the ones that are in everybody's mind away get this thing done and retire a very rich and successful millionaire but man we're talking a lot about it here and that's still next week we're gonna break that board down next week on the show no, you mentioned that we heard uh, UFC president Dana White says it's not Brock and it's not John Jones it's making $5 million a fight. It's Canadian George St. Pierre, and I don't blame him if he decides to leave the, the sport or leave the UFC right now because he is at the top of his game. We know that Rory McDonald is wanting to make yep. his run for that title, and, and right now the welterweight landscape just full of promising stars, uh, guys that have really impressed Robbie Lawler, reinvigorated with his stoppage over Josh Koscheck. So I think uh, right now uh, it's probably a good time for George St. Pierre to leave because this is quickly becoming a young man's game. Yeah, and he's nowhere near the same position that we see Cain Velasquez at right now. Cain Velasquez is a dominant champion who is out to prove in this upcoming fight with Junior Dos Santos that he is the real thing and he will now be a dominant guy. So at different stages of their career. For, for Cain Velasquez, right now is the time to prove that you are absolutely the number one guy. Put this trilogy underneath your belt and uh, move on and try to be a dominant champion the way that GSP has. But Junior Dos Santos will have something to say about yeah, that. I want to talk about that heavyweight matchup quickly. Uh, Junior Dos Santos was able to take Cain Velasquez out very quickly in that first fight. We all know we did not get to see the best Cain Velasquez. He was injured going into that fight. We did get to see one of the best performances by the uh, American Kickboxing Academy representative in the second matchup. Absolutely brought it to Junior DeSantos. Wore this guy out. So you would imagine that JDS has an advantage going into that third fight is he's been able to see the best Cain Velasquez where I don't think Cain Velasquez got to see the best Junior DeSantos. In that first fight, a perfectly placed punch was landed and Velasquez fell down. Yeah, you know what? I mean, they fought 26 minutes and four seconds and in that entire time, Dos Santos landed one monster punch. But uh, the champ, Cain Velasquez, dominated him for much of that, for all of that second fight. I think of your Velasquez, you feel like you're the alpha male in this relationship. You feel like you're the guy who can dominate this guy again. And you know what? If Dos Santos doesn't put him away with one shot, uh, Velasquez will own. When we come back to five rounds, we will hear from one of Canada's longest running mixed martial arts promoters. Welcome back to five rounds. MFC 38 behind enemy lines goes down on October 4th from the Shaw Conference Center in Edmonton, Alberta. We are now joined by the promoter, one of the craziest men in mixed martial arts, Mr. Mark Pavlich. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to be here today with you guys. You know that, right? I'm huge fans of yours. So, Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm stoked. We get to talk about what's going down for MFC 38. Uh, great main event. 
When you're putting together cards, what's the genesis? Tell us, talk us through how you put your cards together. You know, I, I was saying a long time ago before anybody else was saying about, I want fighters to finish. I don't want people to leave it to the ref. Um, I've always been a big advocator. I want a full fighter. I don't want, you know, jujitsu based. I don't want wrestling based and I don't want stand up based. I want a combination of all. I don't want some guy that's just great at standing up and he's okay on the ground. I don't want a guy that's just, you know, great on the ground, but not that great standing up. It's a combination of the three. Uh, I'm just changing gears here for a second. What did you think of the Toronto Maple Leafs fight performance the other day? I know you're not a fan, but you watched the game. Well, you know what's different? There is a difference in Toronto now. And, and, and you know, being a person that's a huge Detroit Red Wing fan, but at the same time is, I'm a fan. You can of, say that in Edmonton? Uh, yes, I can. I, I'm, a su I'm a pseudo Edmonton <laughs> fan right. as well, right? On the, on the side note, because some of the guys I know play for the team that support the Maximum Fighting Championship. But, but at the same time is, Toronto showed a lot of character. They really did. That's just my opinion in it. Um, I look at them differently now. I have a, much more respect for them, but I really saw a grid in them where they're going to be very dangerous this year. Because you like guys with balls. Well, no, I, li I like people with, that show character. I think it's a character issue, and, and, I, and I think they've showed that just in this last, even in the preseason. I, I think they're going to be trouble this year. I want to talk about the main event. Sam Alvey taking on Jason South, undefeated. Uh, what do you like about this fight? Well, you know, the main event has been now, It's we had the contest. We had a contest for the main event, and Burchak and uh, Tito Jones are now the main event. I mean, the voting poll was incredible. Nice. Um, tens of thousands of people voted on Twitter and Facebook, and the fans, they wanted, uh, Bur you know, Burchak and uh, Tito Jones as the main event, the smaller guys. Yeah. And, you know, I know Mr. Ram is going to be upset about that yeah. as a heavyweight, but... You know, I let the fans decide, and, and uh, South and LV are going to be the co-main event, and along with Rama and Hamilton, they're going to be the other one. And you got Rama as uh, an undefeated, really young heavyweight. Do you believe this guy's the real thing? Well, he's ranked, you know, 35th in the world right now after six fights. Um, hand speed wise, what I was shocked about when I when I watched him is his hand speed at that size. I think still as a young kid, he still hasn't reached his potential with conditioning. And I just seen this fight camp, a lot of the tapes that I've saw, seen on him, I was amazed at his conditioning. I think it's a whole nother level now. Novaeus versus Southern, rematch. Yeah. Why are we seeing the rematch? I, and I feel sorry for them because there's been so many title fights. There's three title fights on the show. And then Novias and Southern, I mean, just arguably Southern's right now one of the best 155ers yeah. in Canada. Yeah. There's no question about that. And, and Novias is, is a world Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion. And, and, and I'm telling you, like, the last fight was incredible. And I, and I think this one is going to match the same way. You still having fun doing this? You still enjoy? You like when well, you come into the studio? You're so comfortable in here, putting your own mic on, joking around with the crew. But you know, it, it's when you're passionate about something. You, it's I'm blessed. You know, I I use that term. I'm not lucky. I'm blessed because I've been doing what I've loved doing for 14 years. And you guys know in the mixed martial art business, not mm -hmm. too many people have been around doing this for 14 years. Well, how come you've been able to do it? I love it. I, I, it's beyond love. It's like a, it's like an, a, it's a comfortable obsession. That's the term I guess I can use. It's not a it's not a dangerous obsession. It's it's a comfortable we can obsession. To that. Do you, do you, uh, are you in cruise control at this point? Or are there still challenges that uh, arise every day for you? No, I sleep about four hours a day, and and I guess if I was in cruise control, I'd sleep like normal people eight hours a day. I just have a constant fear of losing it all the time. I have a constant fear of not being the best show in Canada. I have a constant fear of of people just going, well, he's the best show in Canada, but where is on the grand scheme of things I wake up to that one every day pretty much yeah. you know I wake up in the morning where people are like well why does he go to the US and I tell people all the time that's an economy thing that's not so much a mixed martial art thing I mean the maximum fighting championship tickets are very expensive and in the States you couldn't charge that type of money so that's always been my big you know kind of hesitation of going to the United States American people ask us every day I receive hundreds of emails a week about that and I try to explain to them that's not a it's not really a geographic thing it's more of a financial yeah. thing yeah uh, you, you're still enjoying this we but we, we talked to some fighters right and Chris Weidman was in the other day and he says he just lives for competition that's what motivates him to compete constantly every day sure. is that why you relate to these guys are you like that I think mine's much different I think I think if I had the athleticism of, I mean, my, if I had the athleticism of John Jones, I would be UFC champ today with my mentality. I just don't have that athleticism. My mentality has always been strong. Even when I train fighters in the UFC like Jason McDonald, Victor Valimaki, all those guys, I trained them before and managed them prior to you know the MFC taking off. And that was very important for people to understand. They didn't come to me because I can show them how to do better jujitsu. They didn't come to me because I could show, they showed them, they came to me because of my mental fortitude, right? My mental, I'll work harder than the next guy. The, all the shows could get together in Canada, which they try to do. They can all get together and try to like, you know, overtake the MFC 
it's impossible. You have to understand, like, the only thing that's ever going to stop the MFC is us. Nobody's going to stop us. It's just going to be us. I mean, when you look at the fact that um, Edmonton, Alberta is a hotbed for mixed martial arts, and you see all these other promoters try to come into your territory, something that you've built over the last sure. decade or so, is that something that says, you know what, they're not going to be able to get up earlier than, not, than, than I you do. get up? I know yeah. they won't, though, yeah. John. I, I, I see it every day. And, and the difference is this, too. My territory is no longer Edmonton, Alberta. My territory is Canada. Right? I've always been a proud Canadian. I honestly believe I could be the second biggest MMA show in the world from being from Canada. I really believe that. Most people believe we're like third or fourth in the world now. And it's, and it's like, you know, we did our show in Ontario and I think that's very important. I think Ontario needs to be done properly. And I, and I honestly believe that our family is the only one that could do it properly. I've seen other people come and I just kind of think they fell a little bit short. They just haven't gone all the way through with it. And, and I think our family has been the one family that could take our formula. We did at Caesars Windsor and it was very, very successful. I think it's time like, you know, with our new partnerships and stuff like that in Ontario that we return. What can fans expect from this card, MFC 38? The same thing you expect from all our shows, right? I, I, I expect it to be the, the speed of the fights. I, I expect to be, you're going to see a heavyweight fight that's going to look like a 145-pound fight. You're going to see the 135-pound title look like 100-pound guy. I mean, the speed of the Maximum Fighting Championship is what the big difference is now. The action goes down on October 4th at the Shaw Conference Center in Edmonton, Alberta. Don't change the channel. More five rounds when we return. Welcome back to Five Rounds. Ram Dean and Black with you at UFC Fight Night 29. A number of fighters will be stepping into the world famous octagon for the very first time. Well, top Canadian lightweight Jesse Ronson told us what it was like his first time. Tell me about the actual experience of your first UFC fight and any stories that come to mind. Uh, it was amazing. Like, the first day we got there, we got there early. Me and Clements were the first ones there. They uh, weighed us right away, which was just to make sure that everybody's pretty close because obviously they're the highest professional organization so they want everybody to be on weight so they're not worried. Then I had to sign like 200 posters which was pretty crazy so I was there for about a half an hour just signing posters and I've never done that before so that was different and I, I liked it, Clements hated it but it was pretty cool to me. And then so that's day one and then what are, the, what are some of the things you go through? What was the good? What was some of the bad? What was unexpected? Uh, unexpected was uh, all the photos that we had to take. Like, uh, I had, they gave us an itinerary of the stuff we had to do. We had to be up at eight o'clock in the morning one morning to do a breakfast television show, which uh, we were cutting weight and they wanted us to exercise and work out. And I was like, that's not happening, but you still got to do it. Uh, I had to go up two different days for photos. I had to do my pre-fight photos, my pre-fight interview. I had to do photos just for the UFC website. They made me do photos for the video game, which is pretty cool. So I might be in the video game. I, I thought that was awesome. And uh, what, like, you were prepared for some of this stuff from Sam and Mark and those guys in here and stories, but, you know, are you ever really prepared and was, how surprising was this stuff and how distracting? Despite everything they told me, it was, you still can't prepare for it. Like, uh, they wanted me on wait many hours before the weigh-in was done. We had to sit around, like, there was just a lot of waiting. But everything worked like clockwork. Like, uh, I, I fought at probably seven o'clock, but they wanted us there at the venue. We were leaving at three, and they had three different buses going at three different times. Everything was just very well prepared, and I, I, I'm not used to seeing that level of organization and having all that staff and all that media there. And despite what they told me, it was still nerve wracking for me. And now, uh, the hours before, now you're at the arena, and it's the couple hours before, you're in the back, you've been in the back fight, uh, training millions of times, but this is different, you know it's different, but how different was all that, that experience right up to walking in the cage? Uh, it was different because there was, there was, what was it, me, Matt Mitrione, Mitch Gagnon, Clements, and uh, Habib Nurmagomedov in there, but I was the only one there at the time because I was the only one fighting on the Facebook. I had a whole dressing room myself, which I thought was pretty cool. And then we had John Jones in the back, like in the VIP, I guess, dressing room when he came. So having all these stars in there, like when I, before I got to fight, uh, Habib showed up, Mitch showed up, Chris showed up. So I have all these, like Josh Thompson's in there, 
and uh, Matt Mitrione's in there, uh, Chris Lytle was in the train, so I'm warming up in front of them, I'm trying to look as cool as possible, but then I had to sit back and be like, wait a minute, I don't need to look good for these guys, I'm fighting, so I gotta do my own thing here. And uh, uh, when it came time to actually get in there now, you, you walk down you, you know, through a, an arena, you've been dreaming about this, you're standing there, like what's all that process like? You prepared for it, you mentally prepared for it, all of that, but how did that all feel? Uh, it felt like I felt loose. I felt ready. It was I felt good to go all the way up until they're like We ro like Bert said we roll in they open they open the, the, the curtain and I can hear all these people screaming And then I, I just saw the, the, the mass venue that we were in and then having all the cameras just But really everything was okay up until that point and then I, I, I got to the octagon and I got the Vaseline on my face hug my corner and then when I got into the cage I, I smacked the side like I normally do and just looking in the middle and just seeing UFC, that's what really, I, I, I froze. I took a deep breath and I was like, wow, this is really the UFC. And I ran around and normally I've got like a, a mean look on my face and everything. All I could think about was, holy crap, I'm in the UFC pacing back and forth. Like this is, this is actually happening. Am I going to, like, am I going to pass out? And I, I just didn't feel like myself for the first round. Afterwards, when you know, 15 minutes is done and all that, how did all of that feel standing in there experiencing all that? That felt great. Like it, it felt good to get my feet wet in the UFC and then just knowing that I've actually accomplished something that I've been wanting since I was 13 years old, getting that first fight in the UFC. And Robin, Jesse Ronson seems like he's a very grounded guy and for years we've been hearing about him saying that he is the next guy from the Adrenaline Training Center in London to make it to the UFC while well, he's made it there. Uh, what do you expect from this guy moving forward? Well, just getting that one out of the way was excellent for him. Three hard, hard rounds with a very legit guy who had just dropped down to 155. And he took this fight on short notice. Yeah, got that under his belt, did well, so the future's good for him. Uh, coming up next week on Five Rounds, we will hear from a former Affliction executive. We'll talk about the welterweight division, and then we want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions about what's going on in the world of mixed martial arts. So send us your questions via Twitter, including what do you think about the UFC re releasing Yushin Okami? To me, it makes no sense, but give us your thoughts. On behalf of Robin Black and our entire Fight Network crew, I'm John Ramdean saying so long. We'll see you next time on Five Rounds.